Hey Ramblers, this video covers chapter 4.2 in our textbook and deals with optimization. Now the maximum and minimum values of things have a lot of practical applications in our society and in our everyday lives. For instance, when you go to the grocery store, you know, you can look up and down the aisles of all the canned foods and to a large extent, they're the same size. I mean, the vendors want to have an equal volume um, of their product, but they want to minimize the amount of metal that's used for their can. Or sodas. Sodas all come in 12 ounce cans. Why are they pretty much all the same shape? I mean, some foreign brands are kind of thinner, but for the most part, here in America, all the soda cans look pretty much the same. It's because they're trying to minimize the amount of aluminum they use to, to make the can. Cereal boxes, the same way. They pretty much all deliver roughly the same amount of cereal, and so the boxes are pretty much the same size. Rather than being long and short, they all tend to be pretty much tall and thin. All right, well, we're going to learn how to, how companies or how people find maximum values using calculus. The optimization skills, the first derivative, the second derivative, those are going to be tools that we use to find optimal values. So we're going to uh, go back and take another look at the um, definition of global max and global min. And then we're going to look at the extreme value function before looking at an example of a, uh, a function and, and trying to find the maximum and minimum values of it. Okay, so take good notes, pause it often if you need to, and thanks for watching. We've talked about global maximums and global minimums, and we defined them in the last video. It's worth bringing that back. It's also worth mentioning that maxima and minima are the plural forms of maximums and minimums. So let's take a look at that definition again. Global minimums and global maximums refer to the entire domain or just an interval on the domain. Let's take a look at this diagram. Here we can see we have a function in blue and it appears as though this function continues to um, increase as x goes to negative infinity and as x goes to positive infinity. If that's the case, then point A here on the right would be a local minimum and the global minimum because it's the lowest y value on the entire um, uh, function. So that's why, as you can see from the definition, the global min is less than or equal to all values of f. Now, point B, you can see, is a local maximum. But since the function continues to increase as x goes to positive negative infinity, it is not a global maximum because the function gets bigger. So as you can see from the definition of global max, since there are greater than or e there are other y values greater than or equal to the value at b, then it's not a global maximum. And point c here is just a local min. Since it's not as low as point a, it can't be a global minimum. There is only one global minimum and one global maximum for a function. Now, in that last example, we saw that there was no global maximum. And we can imagine other um, functions where there was no global maximum or global minimum. You know, just taking a look at any plain old cubic, that's going to increase to infinity as x goes to infinity. and decrease to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. But there is a theorem that on a closed interval you must have a global max and a global min. So let's take a look at that. It's a pretty straightforward theorem and it basically says that if a function is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, so it's important that you recognize it's a closed interval so the endpoints are included, then F has a global max and a global min on that interval. So let's take a look. Um, the function on the left is including a and b. So this is a closed interval. And you can see that there's some local minimums in the interior of the uh, uh, interval and that the global max occurs at the interval, at the endpoints a and b. Now in the second example, figure 419, that's an open interval. So a and b are not included you can see that there is a global minimum in the interval, but since the endpoints are not included, 
there is nowhere to say it has a global maximum. So the open interval has no global maximum. The extreme value theorem is only for closed intervals. This brings us to an important caution that when we are finding critical points, we often have to make sure that we check our endpoints. So finding critical points, you have to check the endpoints if you're given an interval because your calculus will not expose or reveal anything special happening in endpoints. You have to know to go back and check them um, and include them as critical points. All right, let's move on to an example of a, um, an optimization problem, similar to what we'll be doing kind of as we uh, roll into the next topic. Let's take a look at the function x cubed minus 9x squared minus 48x plus 52, but this time we're going to look at it on a closed interval from negative 5 to 12. And I'm going to find the critical points, but I'm also going to have to consider the endpoints now. When I make my sign pattern, I have to include the endpoints at negative 5 and positive 12. And even though they're not critical points, we have to consider them as potential candidates for maxima and minima. When I plug in negative 5, negative 2, 8, and, ne and 12, I see that I get y values of negative 58, 104, negative 396, and negative 92. So that means that my global maximum is actually at 104, and my global minimum is at negative 396. So the negative 58 and the negative 92 are the values at my, at my endpoints, but in this case, neither one of them was a global max or global min. In this example, we see that Jared is coughing. The speed in minute in uh, meters per second, and it will be covered by the function v of r, is with which he expels air depends on the radius of the windpipe. And that is go given over the interval from 0 to 9 millimeters. And the function is 0.1 times 9 minus r times r squared. They want to know what value of r maximizes the speed and for what value is the speed minimized. Well, we're going to approach this the way we have every problem up till now. We're going to find the critical points. When I calculate the derivative, I need to use the product rule. So I treated the 0.1 as a coefficient of r squared and took the derivative of, r, of 0.1 r squared times 9 minus r plus 0.1 r squared times the derivative of 9 minus r. Now, if I simplify this, I get 0.3r times 6 minus r. So let's set that equal to 0 and find our critical points. When I set it equal to 0, I see that my derivative equals 0 at x, or I'm sorry, r equals 0 and r equals 6. The derivative is never undefined. So r equals 6 and r equals 0 are my critical points. But I also have to check my endpoints. Okay, we can see that when we plug into the um, derivative to find our signs for the sign pattern, that any value between 0 and 6 is going to give me a positive value for the derivative, which will mean it will increase. Then, at, um, for values beyond 6, I, uh, the second part of the term will be negative, so the, der um, the derivative will be negative, and therefore the function is decreasing. That would mean I have a global max at 6 because it has to be the tallest um, on the interval. And at 0, I have a minimum. And at, uh, I would also have a minimum at the other endpoint of 9. Now, which one's less? Well, we'd have to plug back into the original equation. As you can see, if I plug 9 back into the original equation, 0 will give me a value of 0. So v of 0 equals 0. And if I plug 9 in, v of 9 would also equal 0. So there is one global minimum. It occurs at two places. And that's an important thing to remember, that uh, maximums and minimums are y values. So the global minimum equals 0, and occurs at r equals 0 
and 9.